All right, it's the end of the session. This is Lola, this is Riley, and this is their roadmap to success. Lola, I have a special place for Lola because she looks a lot like my dog, California. Um, all right, so basically uh, Lola is a little bit uh, nervous around people. She doesn't know. Riley is nervous about the dog door, uh, dog door. And you saw that little jump? That's due to the cortisol in his blood. So cortisol is a stress hormone. I think both of these dogs are a little bit confused with where their position is. I think they think that they need their job is to take care of the humans, but the humans don't listen to the human doesn't listen to the dog, and so that stresses the dog out, thinking that it's the, the human is putting itself in danger. And just like a mom whose child isn't listening to them and do, engaging in unbalanced or behaviors that are going to be dangerous, the mom starts getting stressed. The more that the child does it, the more stressed the mom gets. The more mom gets stressed, the more the child acts out. It becomes a vicious cycle. Same sort of thing is going on here. Can we lie down? Now he, just a little backstory. His guardians out in the garage. He was sent to a shelter as a puppy because some really evil person decided to sew his mouth shut at eight weeks old. He's had a tough time. But since then, his guardian has rescued him and he's got a great house now. He's got a pool, he's got a huge lot. Uh, he's in Agora Hills. The fire was just right next door, didn't touch the house, but literally about a dozen feet away is where the fire stopped. Um, so basically, uh, he. a lot of people, when we rescue a dog like this, we feel so bad for what happened to them that we wanna to try to make up for it. But if you miss your child's 16th birthday, you can't like the next day show up, I'm so sorry I missed your birthday. Here's a bottle of Jack Daniels and some firecrackers. You can't make up for something by breaking other rules. And a lot of people do that with dogs. Now when we rescue a dog from a bad situation, we need that dog to know, look, you are in a good safe place. We're not gonna abuse you. The things that happened to you before aren't gonna happen anymore. But if we continue doing that for a long time, it can actually become a crutch. And actually it can lead to problems because for dogs, anything a dog is doing when you pet it is what you are specifically rewarding. The most common mistake that I see as a dog behaviorist is people rewarding dogs for unwanted actions or behaviors, unintentionally uh, reinforcing it. Now let's say he's afraid of the dog door. He goes, looks at the dog door and he gets spooked and I say, it's okay, Riley, good boy. It's okay, Riley, good boy. And I say that same sing-songy version of it. Come. That's passive training, we'll talk about that in a minute. Well, after a while, the only time that Riley hears, it's okay, good boy, is when he's scared. So he will start acting a little scared, and after a while, he'll start becoming scared because he gets petted when he hears, when he is fearful, and he gets that attention. Any attention for dogs is ultimately validating. And anything a dog is doing when we pet it is what we're reinforcing. So if a dog comes up to you and is very nervous, you can, you know, in, the, in a really bad crisis, you can pet a dog, but you don't want to do it on a long-term basis because it really is debilitating. Instead, what I can do is I can lay my hand on Riley and let him know I'm here with you. Dogs do associate touch with affection without amplifying it by going back and forth and petting him like I am now. All right, so um, uh, to help the guardian with that, what I went over was what I call petting with a purpose. Petting with a purpose is basically when the dog comes and nudges or paws or barks at you for attention, if you do what the dog tells you, that is a way of validating to the dog that yes, you are the boss of me. So instead what we do is when the dog does that is we give it a counter order, we tell it to sit. If it's already sitting, we ask it to come and sit over here. Uh, we ask him to lie down or whatever it is. Go ahead, come on in. This is a video for you and prim primarily the guardian. You just walk through the door as you're watching this. Um, so basically, petting with a purpose is if I want to pet the dogs or the dogs are telling me what to do, I'm going to redirect them and do something I want, a desired behavior like a sit down or something along those lines. As soon as the dog sits, I pet it under the chin whenever possible and I say the word sit and only the word sit. Avoid saying good sit or the dog's name or oh, what a smart dog, Riley. You, look how well you sat down. Sit and sat are completely different command words. And dogs typically can the first word that you say. So if you say good sit, you're putting the important word in the, sec in the position the dog's gonna listen to the least. So I want you to be in the habit of just saying just sit or crash for lay down or come or whatever it is. Now, if you've been saying come for the dogs, he doesn't always like to come inside. He likes to yell at the squirrel and, and bark at the squirrel in the tree. Now, if we've been saying come, 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 and he hasn't come, we've probably watered down that word. He's probably not gonna respond very well to that. So what we could do is, is for passive training, come up with a new command word. So I'll explain passive training in one sec. To wrap up and put a button on petting with a purpose. If the dog tells you what to do, you give it a counter order. Or if you want to pet the dog, you give it a counter order. When it sits, you pet it under its chin and say sit or whatever the word, whatever it did, and then you can pet it as long as you want after that. I'm not saying you can't pet your dog, you're just gonna make your dog earn it. 
This is gonna boost the dog's self-esteem. It's gonna, also gonna help it practice a very rudimentary basic behavior and also increase the dog's respect for you as an authority figure because no longer do you just give it out for no reason. The dog has to earn that affection. Yes, and he's a lover. He deserves it too. You had a tough time uh, starting off. People are evil sometimes. All right, now uh, I was talking about passive training. That's what I did with Lola right there. So passive training is waiting for the dog to voluntarily offer you the behavior that you want and then rewarding them without you influencing them. So Lola came to me for no, for just, just to come and check in. I had a treat that might've influenced a little bit, but I didn't ask her to come. I didn't give her a hand signal. I didn't offer the treat. She just came and when she did, I gave her the treat and I said the word come. Now, if you've been saying the word come, I would recommend probably you change it to hear, a distinct new word. So every time that Riley or Lola comes up to you, just pet her and say come, or excuse me, here. Every time they sit down next to you, pet them and say sit. Every time they lay down, pet them and say crash. Every time they go to dog bed, we call it Cabo. Whatever it is. So now, a lot of us don't unintentionally train our dogs to misbehave because it steals the remote control, we chase it or we get mad at it. It chews up the dog bed, we get upset with it. Any attention's validating. So now the dog's rewarded for chewing on the dog bed. Instead, we're gonna start rewarding the dog for doing the things we like, like sitting, coming to me, laying down, um, I taught my dog to grumble this way. Taught another of my dogs to stretch this way. Every time the dog stretched on its own, I would say stretch and pet it. And after a while, I could say stretch and he puts his butt in the air, waggle his tail and go, Rrr! and I could get him to do it 10 times in a row on command. So uh, it's a great way to help your dog uh, just to reinforce these are the things that I want you to do and these are the things to get my attention. With petting with a purpose, what will happen is the dog's gonna come start sitting in front of you to prepay for attention. When he does, make sure you recognize that otherwise they're gonna go back to nudging you, jumping up on you. Uh, passive training, every time they do something you want, you want to use passive training to reward them. Now, I have four dogs, and I, each one of my dogs has a unique word to eat their food. The way I assigned it is through passive training. When my dog Farley takes his first bite of food, I say the word chow. I did that for about two months. Now, I have three other dogs. They're sitting in the corner. When they hear the word chow, there's no food in their mouth. When Farley hears the word chow, there is food in his mouth. So to Farley, chow means eat. To Callie, Quest, and Max, it doesn't mean anything. When Farley's done, I have him leave the area. Then I invite Kelly in, or well, I, I don't invite her in. I say the word grub, which is her word eat. So for two months, every time she took her first bite of food, I said the word grub. That's her specific, unique word to eat. And then I'm um, preparing in case uh, the uh, black dog comes over here so I can actually reward her for a pa little passive training. Nope, she's going to the dog door. Are you gonna, nope, she's going to the dog door. So I'm not trying to entice her. If she would have come to me, I would have petted her, given the treat. So come up with a command word for each dog to eat and stop leaving the food in the bowl. Right now the guardian is free feeding the dogs and so the dogs eat whenever they want, sometimes in front of the guardian. For dogs, eating is a very important activity. They spend 90% of their time in the wild eating or looking for food. So when they do find food, they eat in the order of their rank. The leaders eat first, then the followers. So if Riley is the senior dog, I would probably feed far, uh, Riley first, unless Riley is being a pill, barking and charging and trying to get to the food, then I might feed Lola first because she's giving me the behavior that we want. Coffee for closers. Um, so, and actually on that one, uh, and so for structure feeding, I have a video for that. So make sure you let me know if, for any of these things. If you don't know how to do them, I have videos for pretty much everything I can share with you. Coffees for Closers is a great scene. So go to YouTube and just go, uh, just search for Coffees for Closers. Watch the scene. It, for what you do for a living, you'll think it's really funny. But the idea for Coffees for Closers is I'm going to reward the dog or the, the behavior that I want first click. So if I have a treat out, or I don't have a treat out, but I want the dogs to come. And there's not, I'm not competing with distractions with squirrels or other things. I say the word here. And let's say that Riley comes up first and sits down. I'm going to give them the treat and say here. Lola comes a minute after she says, Riley gets a treat, comes and sits down. Well, she didn't give me the same effort that he did, so she doesn't get paid for that. Now, you could pet her if you want, theoretically, but I think these dogs are used to uh, competing for their guardian's attention. I want them to start competing to be obedient. So every once in a while, maybe pull out a little ramekin and put like 10 treats in it. And by the end of the day, have called them or asked them to sit or whatever the action is 10 times and only the, reward, only the one who comes first gets the reward. Now eventually they'll start doing it at the same time. If both of them come at the same time and give you the reward, then you can give them both the same reward. Go, yeah, uh, dog door's open, it's a little cold out here. Um, and so if they're giving the same performance, then we give them the same payment. But if you had somebody come to your house and one guy worked his tail off and the other guy didn't and you're paying them separately, you wouldn't give them the same payment. Same thing will motivate the dogs to want to listen to us. Um, all right, so petting with a purpose and passive training uh, are two of the easiest things you can do. If you get in a habit of doing them, every time you pet your dog, it becomes a micro training session like I mentioned. 
Now come up with a list of the official command words for your dogs. Most of us don't realize that we assign about 10 different expressions for each command action. Come, here, come here, come here, over here, here boy, dog's name, dog's nickname, tap my thigh, whistle, something else. Now the dog has to listen for 10, 15 words for each command. And we say between 2,000 and 11,000 words a day, every one of us does as humans. That's a lot of words for the dog to monitor, to listen for. It's much easier if we have 10, dog knows 10 commands and there's only 10 command words. So come up with a list of the official command words. Now the words you've already assigned, that's fine, use them. But if you haven't assigned something like for lay down, come up with funny command words. Dogs should read facial expressions. So if you say crash, your dog flops down, your friends laugh, that motivates your dogs to want to do that. And all it costs you is a little bit of uh, imagination. Now, if you've already, like I said, said down, that's fine. You can keep doing it if you want to transition it. Every time the dog lays down on its own, pet it and say crash. That's where you want to change to. That's really through passive training. And the way to test that is to turn away from the dog, because so, dogs can read your lips. So turn away from the dog and say crash. So we can hear it, but can't see you saying it. If they lay down, then you know they have the auditory cue. If not, then you have to keep on practicing. Just wait for the dog to do it voluntarily, then say the word, and again, not good crash, just crash. Now, um, for the, uh, there's a video here for the dog door, and I reused a lot of operant conditioning for that one. I would recommend you probably do go get one of those, uh, go to Amazon and get one of those uh, play gates. Uh, it's a, it messaged me if you can't find it, but just a dog play pen. They, and get the metal one, not, oh, she hears food, he hears food, he's gonna go get, try to get him some. Um, so basically for the, uh, uh, I, I get the 40 inch tall stuff, and ah, he's about to give the camera a nudge. And then basically uh, what I would do is put it around the dog door on the outside with both dogs in the pen with the dog door open. They're both conditioned to run to the door. So then I would have somebody ring the doorbell. I know Lola's gonna run through it. I'm hoping that he will run through it, especially if you practice the other things. Try to be within four inches of the dog's nose whenever you use that. Yeah, anytime you use a treat, you wanna keep your, the, the reward close. What she was trying to do is what I showed the uh, guardian is to how to put a dog in a sit. So this dog's nose, I'm gonna hold my hand like this with a treat in it, and I'm gonna go and arc over their head, but I wanna try to stay within four inches. As the dog tracks up to get more elevation, they'll eventually put their butt down. As soon as they sit, I lower it, let the dog dip its head down and lick up the treat. And remember, always say the command word after the treat goes in their mouth. Um, I showed the guardian how to teach the dogs to go to the dog bed. If you remember, if you have any questions about that, message me, I'm happy to send you a video on that. I showed you the escalating consequences, hiss, stand up, march, and leash time out. I didn't go over leash time out because your dogs don't really wear collars. Make sure that you practice uh, those if you, and I have videos for that if you can't remember. Now, if they don't want to come to you, because a lot of us, we only ask the dog to come when the end of playtime. The dog's out there having a great time yelling at the squirrel, we say come, and it comes and closes. The, we close the door, and then it, the fun is over. So every once in a while, walk out in the yard, walk out on your deck, right to the edge of the grass with a treat. And just stand there, and when one of the dog comes over to you, give it the treat and say the word here, and then walk back inside. Then about five minutes later or whenever, like next time, walk out again, maybe one step closer to the house. So you don't, the first time you walk 20 paces out there, maybe next time you do 19. And the first, and wait, and don't call the dogs, wait for them to come. As soon as they do, give them a treat. At this point, you can give them both a treat because you're not asking them a command. You're just rewarding them for coming to you. But we're not making them come all the way to the door over here. We're making them just come to me and then they get a treat. And each time you go one step uh, less out the door until eventually you just open the door and say, come and they both come to you. And then you can eventually throw the treat inside and you can say inside if you want that to be the command word or casa or whatever it is. Uh, I didn't go over this with you in the session, but I like to give dogs directional commands and uh, teach them to leave the room. So a real easy way to do that is there's one of the rules, as I said, the dog should be on the carpet or on the couch here when anyone here is eating food. Well, we first have to teach the dog what leaving means. And an easy way to do that is the dog's here, I touch the dog's nose with the treat, and then I throw the treat over there, outside of the boundary. And I, just, and I don't entice the dog, I let the dog see me do it, and I just wait. When that goes over and licks it up, I would say the word out. Then it's gonna come back and I would do it a second time. I would probably do this with each dog separately. Go to every area of your house you wanna ask the dog to leave, as well as every doorway. Now some rooms that they don't ever go in, like the laundry room, you have to worry about that. But this way we put things in, in, in uh, we quantify or we put things in, can't think of the word I'm looking for, it'll come to me, uh, in context. And so leave means to leave this area and get rewarded for leaving the area. So now we provide the motivation and, let the, and create a vocabulary term and they want to do whatever it is. So what I usually do is I do two treats for every area I wanna ask them to leave for one dog. Throw it, out, come back, throw it, out, then go to the next area. Throw it twice, out, out. 
Then I'd repeat the whole circuit, but then I'd be there throwing it in, but I would still say the word out, because out just means leave the area that I'm at. And now after you do that, if you do that with each dog, with uh, maybe uh, with twice in every room or portal, um, maybe for one or two days, after a while you say out, and the dog will run over there automatically. Um, let me see, remember you go to, go to Groupon, order the dog beds, make sure they're cream or white or light gray, and get the Sealy Posturepedic or the memory foam and get a jumbo one so that they can sit there to and lay there together. That's one of the things that I really love and it'll be helpful for the dogs. Uh, let me see, what else did we go over? Um, I went over um, the cleaning the door. Um, now the first thing for the door, remember go to the door with some treats and throw the treat over and say Alabama or whatever the word is that means to go to the spot behind the boundary away from the door. And do that a couple times without anybody at the door. Do that a couple times and then walk away and eat your soup or do whatever you want to do, then go back and do it again. After a while, you should be able to say Alabama or whatever the word is and they run over behind the line. And don't be afraid to put painter's tape down so they know exactly where that line is. So the first stage is just to condition them to walk away from the door. They're practicing kind of the same thing I did in the video above about the, uh, uh, the dog door. So the next step is uh, having a family or friend or neighbor help you with the door. So when people are coming over, tell them that can come in on their own, tell them to, to not use the garage door, not let themselves in, to go to the door and knock, but to text you first. So if you're doing like some finger painting and you're cooking and you're eating, you're talking on the phone, somebody goes to the door, you're rushing to try to get all these, hang up the phone and turn the stove down and wash my hands and get to the door. Well, you know it's somebody that's in on it with you. So you, they text you, I'll be there in a couple minutes, you wash your hands, you turn the stove down, you, uh, you, know, you get off of your phone call, you pretend like you're still painting, you pretend like you're still on the phone, and when somebody comes to the door, you very casually answer the door so the dog doesn't think, holy cow, I have to protect her, which is, I think, part of the reason why they're so anxious. Um, and then basically walk to the door, pick one dog first, and focus on that dog. Walk, reverse her and walk directly at that dog until it crosses the line, wait for it to stop moving, then take one step backwards, pause. If it comes forward, march to at it again. Keep going back and forth until that dog sits or lays down or stays behind the line. Once the dog's staying behind the line, then walk backwards, and the other dog's over here, walk backwards with your butt facing this way, your front facing this way, and the dog's here, get behind the dog so that your, your front is facing this dog and the dog that's behind the line, and then make this dog move back. And again, you're having a family member or friend do it. If you want to be nice, put a nice tea or something out there so that if, and a chair so they can sit down or ring the doorbell. I usually have people ring the doorbell and knock every 10 seconds. I want to make it as hard as possible so it's a real person that knocks twice, that's super easy for the dogs to do. So the idea is to practice that and again, break down answering the door in each individual step. I'm not going to go through it all here because it's going to be a really long video, but just message me if I don't already have cleaning the door video uh, listed up above. I also have a technique to stop dogs from jumping. I'm gonna put, I'm gonna hopefully remember to put it up there, but if I forget, just shoot me a text. Hey David, can you text me uh, the keyword? If you text me, just say, can you put, link the honey jumping exercise to my write-up? There's a, a, a golden doodle I named uh, Honey that like to jump up on people, and I showed, uh, I have a video that shows how to stop the dog from doing that. Um, so recreate that as many times as you can. So that's really tackling the door issue on multiple angles. But that way the dogs are not rushing the door. They're staying behind the line and we go answer the door and there's some extra distance and that extra distance helps it be not so intense for them and helps them relax and calm down. Um, let me see, what else? Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else we went over. Oh, exercise. So um, the, remember to use the, the stairs. Start that exercise journal. Go to the top of the stairs with one of the dogs with an empty stomach Throw the treat to the bottom of the stairs and go up with a word that means to go down and a word that means to come up. And keep doing it like we did with Lola until Lola just lays down and says, I'm not coming up anymore. Now you know what Lola's maximum number is. Let's say it's 50. So maybe three times a day, we just go up there and we throw the treat up and down uh, 25 times or 20 times. I usually do about a third to 50% of what the maximum is. And exercise for dogs is best sprinkled throughout the day. Now, the guardian's not here all day long, but if she can come home, if she's in the area, uh, try to just take them out and play fetch for a little bit or uh, the up and down or whatever it is on the stairs. And burning off that excess energy is really gonna help because I think that Riley is licking his back paws a lot. I think it's anxious, anxiety. I don't think it's an actual allergy because he's not doing it for the front, but it's a compulsion. And it's related to having too much, uh, not enough exercise, thinking that he's in charge of the human, the human doesn't listen, having lower self-esteem and getting attention on demand, which we seem nice, but earning his affection will really have a profound impact on his self-esteem and confidence. So no more free pets, make him earn those, and that will really help him. Also, try to treat, teach your dog new tricks or commands. I know life happens, we're busy, but it's very therapeutic. 
Go to YouTube. I'm happy to share some videos with you as well. Just text me. But if you go to YouTube, just search for easy dog tricks. Teach my dog to roll over. Teach my dog to play dead. Teach my dog to give me a beer out of the fridge. Whatever it is. Teach your dog that new trick and teach them separately. But teach the same dogs both week. And then all, uh, both the same week. And then practice all week long. Roll over for everything. Then the next week, teach them a new trick. Try to get to the point where the dogs know at least 15 new tricks and commands. This way, you have different ways to distract them. You've boosted their self-esteem. They respect you even more because you're responsible for them learning that new skill. And it just really is uh, beneficial. Uh, and like I said, it's, it's, some people find it cathartic themselves. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else. I think that's pretty much it. If you have questions or problems with a dog door, let me know. I, have, uh, I can counsel you on that. And if, you, if there are questions you forgot to ask me today or something new that happens, I know you're maybe transitioning a new house. So if you have questions in a new place, please let me know. I don't care if you call me five seconds after I walk out your door or five years. I've literally had to call me, people call me seven years after I worked with them and that dog's not even around anymore and I help them with a phone call with their other dog and no charger for it. Now, if I have to come out for another session, I'd charge you for it, but I think at this point with your dog's issues, I think it's going to be easy to fix if you put in the work. There's a lot of stuff that we went through, a lot of stuff we covered, so if you don't, uh, you're unsure about any of it, message me, text me the fastest way to reach me. Normally, I would say, this is Riley and this is Lola, but they're not here because their guardian's eating. And remember, oh, down. yes, oh, they're laying down. So remember the rules, not being allowed on this carpet around the couch if anybody here is eating, not being allowed on the, on the actual furniture for 30 days or as long as the problem's still going on, and then after that, only with an permission and invitation and for good behavior. So if you invite them up and start barking, they have to get down. Or if you invite them up and they get to go to get drink water, they need to come back, they need to do another invitation back up. Make sure you're eating before you feed them, no more free feeding. Put the food down, block them the same way I showed you at the door, and then you eat five or chips or a cracker, five bites of a chip cracker, something crunchy, and then invite the one dog to come over and eat. When that one dog's eating, the other dog's not allowed to be within seven feet. When that dog walks away from the bowl, if there's food left over, pick it up, dump it empty, put the empty bowl back down. It's important to put the empty bowl back down. Then that dog moves away, and then we invite the other dog over, and we're gonna give them each the command word to eat by saying the uh, command word when they take their first bite of food, it's a different word for each dog, for about two months. And after a while, we'll be able to say grub, and the dog will just go and eat for themselves. And eventually, they'll just wait outside the boundary. You could be watching TV here, and you say, feast. Some people use the name of their favorite restaurants, the name of their favorite dish. I say grub chow feast and eat. I didn't come up with eat because that's not very fun. Um, but that's a ni nice way for them to develop some self-control. Another rule is they have to sit at the door. So I go to the door and I say sit and I wait three seconds. I only sit, say sit once. If they don't sit within three seconds, I walk away, sit down somewhere. Sitting is, is more permanent and wait one minute. Ask for a, a 60 second timer. After 60 seconds, go back and tell them to sit again. If they don't sit this time, walk away for two minutes, then for four minutes, then for eight minutes. Keep doubling the length of time. And as soon as they sit, open that door and let that dog out. If only one dog sits, let that dog out, not let the other one out. Um, let me see. Uh, fetch is another great way to burn energy. But, you know, for we, I showed the Guardian how to use opera conditioning to teach Lola to bring the ball to her. She would drop the ball there and then kind of whimper and whine. And I had the Guardian ignore. And then as soon as the dog brought to a certain threshold, close enough, then we would pick it up and throw it. So what I did for my dog is at first they made him bring it all the way to me. Once they brought it all the way to me consistently, then I made them sit before I'd pick it up. Then they have to sit and stay until I say release. So you're adding more structure to the game. And even though they really want to do it, they're really excited, they're practicing some self-control, which is really helpful. Um, so uh, now when you're feeding them, if you give them permission to eat their food and the dog sniffs it, walks away, pick up the bowl, dump it, and have, don't have any hesitancy for that, you're giving the dog the opportunity to eat. The dog's saying, no, you're not the boss of me. You don't tell me what to do. That's fine. You're not eating the dog food. That's on the dog's tab. Um, if it goes longer than three days, then message me. But it, usually the only way it goes longer than three days is if the dog's getting food elsewhere because hunger eventually becomes your ally. Um, let me see, don't let the dog run out a door ahead of you. Don't let it go up and down the stairs ahead of you. Teach your dog to stay or wait are also great commands. Message me if you want to do that, and I'm happy to show you how to do that. Um, and then uh, for smoking, remember to put that little pack, uh, business card in the pack of cigarettes with a little pencil. Write down the time that you smoke the first day. Smoke as much as you want, just chronicle the time. At the end of the day, count up how many cigarettes that was. Then the next day, smoke one cigarette less. Set yourself a goal of about 45 days to 60 days away from when you start. Give yourself plenty of time and every day wake up and say, Janu uh, January 21st is going to be the last day I smoke a cigarette. Say it to yourself out loud several times a day. That will help it seep into your memory. You can program your memory to do things. That's why I don't ever say I can't remember. I say I'll think of it in a minute and my brain keeps on working on it. So if you keep on telling your brain this is the last day we're going to smoke a cigarette, 
your brain will start making that connection for you and you're preparing yourself. Then what I did was when I got to the last couple days, uh, last day, I got some of the nicotine, uh, the, the patch, through the, and I smoked my last cigarette and then I put the patch on when I went to bed, woke up the next day and smoke free. The whole idea is you get out of a habit of doing all those other replacements when you're taking those little cigarette breaks. But give yourself a couple of replacement behaviors. Go for a walk around the block. Do a little aerobics or do something that can replace it. A lot of people need an oral fixation, but I find if you have a very short, something you could do in about two to three minutes, which is about how long we smoke a cigarette, that's a nice thing for us to do. And I have a lot of people that actually meditate. I don't need to be too new agey, but just sit there and count to 10 and breathe in and breathe out. I mean, the way I meditate is I just think of, I just count in my head. And as soon as another thought comes in my head, I go back to one. I never make it past like four or five. Just close your eyes, be in a quiet place. One, two, I'm thinking about pizza. One, two, and, or just focus on your breathing or whatever it is. She's a guardian to tell me she's already does that. But that's a good thing to do because now you're helping your center yourself. And instead of focusing on the fiending for the cigarette, you're focusing on a good things. I'm getting an alert. I just did something right on my watch. Okay. Um, well, um, like I said, this is, uh, normally I would have Riley here and I'd have Lola here and I'd say, this is Riley, this is Lola, this is their roadmap to success. Remember. Everything that you do trains your dog, only sometimes you mean it.